start talking about how what can you read the title what's the title what's going on but yeah it's it's kind of got it's there you go um, there it is we're going to talk about the castle keepers yay there it is yay. there it is yay castle keepers yay castle keepers and here we are with three of our wonderful authors that have been on warwick's virtual events multiple times which i absolutely mm -hmm. love and Rachel is always doing our um, interviewing, but Yay. we've also we've also done one of your books before, haven't we? We did that way way back, didn't we? We did Mozart Code with Mozart Kate Code Quinn. With Kate Launch Quinn. night was yeah, yeah, that was fun. That was really fun. Yeah, yeah. So now, and I love when all you ladies get together and you all write a book because I just think that whole process. I'm fascinated by it, so I can't wait for the conversation tonight. <laughs> um but before we get started let me just fill a little bit of time while while uh facebook's letting people know that we're here and that we're live with y'all um and just so that people know who warwick's is if this is your first time joining us so we're located in uh la jolla which is a little bit north of san diego california uh, my little sign there says 1896 so um we are open for business you know business as usual all the way around but i still love doing these virtual events um, it's just a way for us to bring such wonderful authors together because let's see, Amy, you're in Colorado. Yeah. I'm remembering, right. Uh, Rachel, you're in Toronto. If yep. I'm remembering correctly. And Janelle, are you in Virginia? Is that where you're calling in from? Yes. Okay. So we have got the country and not country. <laughs> We've got multiple countries. International. International. International <laughs> yeah. here tonight. We've got all the time zone covered. We got Warwick's in Pacific. I'm in Mountain. Our publishers in Central and Rachel and Janelle are Eastern. Uh, nice. I love it. There's still that event we did with Maggie Brooks where she was in London and we didn't change the time. We didn't change the time. I talked to, I, I mentioned that to somebody. Her the interview. Day. I was like, and she did it and she was she so was awesome so amazing. What a trooper. She's so good such a trooper so we'll try not we to need to get an australian author again. on here and see if we can we that had zone. we had uh, warwick's had um kate morton oh, the other day wow. and so it actually worked because we did it at seven o'clock our time love kate morton she is like yeah, such a lovely geez. human being yeah um it was at seven o'clock our time Pacific at, at night in the Pacific, it was like 9 30 in the morning the next day for her. So it wasn't oh. horrible. So that was it. So we could yeah, do one almost, that sort of yeah. It's but such it would be a like difference. 10 o'clock at works. night for you guys. So on the mm -hmm. East Coast. So that might not work. Anywho, we're gonna talk castle keepers. Let me introduce these three wonderful women to you. I'll go off screen. They're gonna chat for about 35, 40 minutes. Um I'm going to put in the Facebook chat. If you're watching this on YouTube later, stay with us. It's a great conversation. There will be a link to buy the book there, but unfortunately there will be a live Q and A. Um, but if you're on Facebook with us tonight, I'm going to put in the um, comment section there how to order Castle Keepers from us. And that's where you're also going to put any questions that you might have for any of these wonderful authors. Um, and so that will happen at about that the 35, 40 minute mark. I'll probably just, um, pop on like I do, um, Rachel, but I might give you a heads up in the chat that I'm coming on. <laughs> so we'll just let it go. <laughs> so here we go with the intros. Internationally bestselling author Amy K. Runyon writes to celebrate unsung heroines. She has written six historical novels and is delving into the exciting world of contemporary women's fiction. She's been a finalist for the Colorado Book Award three times, a nominee for the Rocky Mountain Fiction Writers Writer of the Year, and a Historical Novel Society's Editor's Choice Selection. Amy is active as a speaker and educator in the writing community in Colorado and beyond. She lives, like we said, in beautiful Rocky Mountains with her. I love the descriptions of all of your um, family members, pets, everything. This is great. Wonderful <laughs> husband, two adorable, usually children, two very sweet cats and a pet dragon. We might have to find out about that later. <laughs> Best-selling author with a passion for heart-stopping adventure and sweeping love stories, Janelle Sazelski weaves fresh takes into romance of times gone by. When not creating dashing heroes and daring heroines, she can be found dreaming of Scotland, indulging in chocolate of any kind, we share that in common, or watching old black and white movies. She's a Florida native who, like I mentioned, lives now in Virginia with her husband, daughter, and lazy beagle. Very Descriptions lazy. are great. Very lazy. lazy beagle. I know. <laughs> Rachel McMillan 
is the author of The London Restoration, The Mozart Code, and The Herringford and Watts Mysteries, The Van Buren and DeLuca Mysteries, and the three-quarter time series of contemporary Viennese romances. She's also the author of Dream Plan Go, a travel guide to inspire independent adventure, which I think she just got back from an independent adventure in Vienna. If yeah. I'm not <laughs> She's a regular interviewer moderator for us here at Warwick with our virtual author events. And like I mentioned, she lives in Toronto. So ladies, have a great conversation. We'll see you in a little while. Thanks, Julie. Yay, Thanks. Thank you. All Thanks. right. Thanks, Lazy Beagle. <laughs> yes, thank you, Lazy Beagle. <laughs> <laughs> I had to kick her out because she was laying right here snoring. And I was like, you have to. <laughs> oh. I think that we should probably tell the listeners tonight, uh, because we just did one of these last week on release day, that you're probably just going to get a behind the scenes of the absolutely constant Facebook direct message group we have going all the time. Yes. <laughs> all the time. This all is time. yes. Like constantly. Like first thing I see when I wake up in the morning, last thing before I go to bed yeah. um, is me. Usually me. We yeah. finally <laughs> named it though. We named it the powerhouse instead of that's this right. Little message group, Janelle and Amy and Rachel. It's now the powerhouse. <laughs> yes. And that was thanks to Stephanie Burns who runs um, the, the tall poppies. You know, okay. she runs our social media and she referred to us as three powerhouse authors. And I'm like, I like that. We'll take We're it. We're taking that. Do it. We're taking it. We're the powerhouse. Mm -hmm. well, just, our next book that we write together is just going to be the powerhouse. Oh, I like that. Oh, I like that too. Let's do that yeah. one. Let's, yeah, let's do yeah, it. Let's do it. The Liberty <laughs> Scarf by the powerhouse. <laughs> um, maybe we should tell everybody about how the cover oh. came about. Yes, oh, we that'd be fun. Because we... Like, I'm trying to think of the things we haven't talked about 80 million times. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, and, yeah, Amy, take it yeah. away. Like, look at how okay, cool this cover so is. I, I'm holding it up. I, I, hopefully, you guys can still hear me. But um, anyway, so we obviously have the women from the three different time periods. Um, for those of you who are new to the Castle Keepers concept, we have a, three different stories from the same family that take place in the same castle, but generations apart. The first story is called The Truth Keepers, and it takes place in 1870, and that's my section. And we have Beatrice, uh, Beatrice Holbrook um, right here in the middle. She is a dollar princess who goes over from America to marry for a title. And then we have our World War I era um, heroine, who is from The Memory Keeper. Hold on, and, my light is being funny. No, I think it is. Okay, guys, yeah. after we talk about the cover, we're going to talk about how we can never remember what our, what our yeah. versions yeah. are called. Yeah, exactly. We can't remember the name of the individual we stories. Never, and, 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 and this is us, our, we'd be like, I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, and this is our World War II era character. Mm. Yeah. And yeah, so we have, and we obviously we have Alnwick Castle. Or actually, no, it's Leedswick Castle, but it's based on Alnwick's Castle, which is where Harry Potter... And the last episode of Downton Abbey was filmed, very famous. And I love that castle. And I said, if we're going to do it, can we base it on this castle? Because it's spooky and creepy. Mm -hmm. But we see the castle in the background. But we spent a lot of time making sure that our heroines um, were dressed appropriately to the <laughs> era, appropriately for our descriptions, but also had some, it had to look unified. Mm -hmm. And so hence, we've got kind of the, the, the beautiful crimson color in their clothing. And we spent a lot of time on that. And you got the lovely, you know, blue sky and the wonderful quote from Eliza Knight, mm -hmm. who has uh, been a wonderful champion her. for us. And yes, we love her. And um, so, yeah, that was that was a, this was um, one of the covers. And I think it's one of the things where um, because we're dealing with three authors that there was a lot of back and forth about what we wanted and what our vision was. But I think the end result, I mean, it's very striking. Um, I, I, the, if I have, I, I, it would be nice if the castle keepers part was a little easier to read, but that's like a, such a minor thing because with so much else was right. It was just nailed. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that was a fun process, but a lot of back and forth, but I think part of it is also that our publisher Harper Muse is so detail oriented when it comes to the covers, they try to get it yeah. so right. And they have done such a good job. I've been through two cover processes with them so far, and it's just impeccable. 
it's just well they really listened to amazing. us yeah when when we had suggestions or no I don't like that or can we try this they were very open to listening to us which is just goes to show how great they are to work with because all the covers that I've had with them, they're they're very much wanting the author's input and wanting to make it just right. So I love because we yeah. each had different ideas and what our heroines should look like and stuff. So it was hard to get that cohesive picture to it, but we were able to come together and figure out something that worked across the board, which was really nice. Exactly. And you know, for me personally, the process has been very different for you. See, I've got my my oeuvre behind me. And, you know, I didn't get a lot of input on my first two covers at all. And gradually I've gotten more and more to the point where like a bakery in Paris, my August title, I said, I want a green bakery window. They said, we got, we'll get you a green bakery window. And it just <laughs> happened. It was great. It's like so. magic. This is my seventh cover with that team. And I have mm -hmm. always, I think they're all gorgeous. And I think yeah. it's something that's, because I always try to, Peel back the curtain a little bit on the publishing industry because I know a lot of people who follow us are aspiring writers themselves or want to break into traditional publishing. There's a lot that goes on in titling and cover committees that are outside of an author's personal preference because the sales and marketing team is looking for what is going to stand out. So the color palette, the yep. font, the you know the unified theme of what's on the cover is often determined by the industry itself they'll go and they'll study covers at target or on the front table at barnes and noble um and they'll see what is working so authors mm -hmm. who are up and coming um the title and the cover is really important in terms of saleability for the book and fortunately absolutely um we were able to land on something that really the team there absolutely loved the concept of. And we're like, yeah, this is really cool. And I'm mm -hmm. fond of it. And it reminds yeah. us of uh, all our fun messages back and forth for a million years. Um, well, the other, the other aspect of this is that it looks like they're walking through a garden, yeah. which has a major point in all of yeah. our stories. So exactly. tell us about the garden, Janelle, because you uh, found it. I did. So as soon as Amy suggested, let's do Alma Castle, I was like, great. And I started researching immediately what this place looked like. That's what I do. And then I stumbled across, this place has a poison garden. And I thought, oh, that's amazing. So of course I jump on the chat and I'm like, you guys, they have a poison garden. We have to include this. And they're like, okay, let's do it. So it turns out that the um, the Duchess of Alnwick Castle, I forgot her actual title, Northumberland. It's the Duchess of Northumberland. That one. So she, a while back- So many books ago for us. <laughs> I know, right? No, but this is like in real life, the Duchess of Northumberland. Yes. Um, Duchess, the real Duchess. The Percy, yeah, the Percy family. Yes. And it's the Duchess of Mar Northumberland. Yeah. Yes. So her husband said- okay, why don't you take over the gardens because that'll give you something to do. And she said, great. Well, she didn't want to plant a rose garden or a hedge garden because everybody else does that. She wanted to do something that would draw in visitors and that would get kids excited when they came to visit. And I was reading that she went to Italy to visit the Medici gardens over there and they had a poison garden. And that's where she came up with the idea. I'm going to plant a poison garden and everybody's going to love it. And I'm going to have people pass out because it's so toxic in the air. And it's, it's an instant hit over there. And it's really neat because it has these black iron um, gates with like the skull and crossbone. And it's like poisonous, you know, it's so atmospheric. And we were writing about this thanks to Janelle and her research on the castle at a time when the industry was an influx of poison garden books. Yeah, <laughs> like it's so funny. Seven the of them guys. came out with all these floral covers of poison <laughs> gardens everywhere. And it was really neat. And the other really neat thing is Janelle is so visual. We were able to get a concept of the garden that had to last through the many different eras and shifts mm -hmm. and changes of the castle. Because when Amy's characters are there, um, it, it looks quite different than when it gets to my portion in 1945, 1946, after the war, when it's been dilapidated, it hasn't been kept up as much. And so the cast of the poison garden is kind of unkempt. And that was really interesting to have that continuity, but also hopefully highlight how 
this grand manner has shifted over time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Because in the 1870s, it was the dawn of the industrial era. And the industrial era was really nascent in like the 1840s and just getting started. But by the 1870s, it was really getting into full swing. But that's when we really begin to see the decline of the moneyed class. I mean, we always attribute it to World War I, which is, you know, a huge, that's when it was a, a this massive social shift. And that's why I think it's such a great time period to write about. It was the death of the aristocracy. It, you know, it was the beginning of the end for the large aristocracy. It became really the house above the shop after that point um, for the British, you know, for the British aristocracy. And it's been shrieking ever since. But 1870, you know, the, the whole almost feudal estate system became absolutely obsolete. And so, you know, some of the estates you know, were able to, to remain relevant often through, you know, it was the beginning of the tourism era, et cetera, and so forth. But they needed an influx of cash to remain relevant because it was hard for them to remain self-sufficient. And it was the beginning of the end. That's why it's an interesting period to start because we attribute so much to World War I, but it really started 50 years before. Mm -hmm. So sorry, I get uh, yeah. No, I, I love it's talking it's a about really because I think that all three of us were very determined to repurpose research from other projects into this um, because we're all very busy writers and we wanted yeah, to we do are. this project so badly, but sometimes readers do not see the amount and depth of research that goes into every book because it's our job to make you experience a historical period but we often have to read and immerse ourselves in far more than ends up in the final product yeah. and so this was one book where it was really going to work out well because when we divided and divvied up who was going to do what period of this castle over three wars um we were all like okay how can we use some of the fragments and <laughs> documents and sources that we've used before and repurpose them so that we're not starting from scratch again so we all got to play in our own little sandboxes a little bit um and that was yeah. kind of interesting and fun and ha yeah, exactly. hallelujah anytime you can reuse something it's yes. awesome oh it's so and, wonderful and the time periods that we're yep. accustomed to writing in yeah, you know, I mean, yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, and the thing that I think the readers need to know about us is that none of us have have written exclusively one time period. No. Now, no, a lot no. of authors, you know, you have Pam Genoff, whose entire career is basically writing love songs to uh, Jewish Europe, um, and so she sticks with World War II. Um, and I, th I don't think she's done a couple that are outside of that sphere, but she's really hyper. She's an expert. And you have people yeah. like Philippa Gregory, who are Tudor historians. I mean, she's a legit historian. And um, so she, I mean, if you told her, write a, you know, write a novel about this obscure Tudor figure from history, she could do it. And she has the library in her home to do it. Whereas the three of us really have written disparate time We've periods. We've I mean, bounced yeah. around. Um, yeah. And one collective thing that we have is that we all my first series was world war world war one era edwardian era mm -hmm. um and janelle's worked in that time period and amy's worked in that time period and when we talk about our next project you're going to see that we all get to finally go back and hang out in that time period for a bit which <laughs> yeah. is really exciting to, to me nice. <laughs> I get to recycle some research from Girls on the Line, which was one of my very favorite projects to work on. The history is just fabulous. Mm -hmm. And there's so much stuff that I couldn't put in that book that I get to put it in this next novella. And in fact, my section for The Castle Keepers, I got to take basically a pitch from a novel that didn't land and, and craft it into something more marketable with the two of you, which was so exciting because I pitched it when my previous publisher said no more World War II were, were oversold. And I was ready to pitch the School for German Brides. I pitched them that. And they said, yeah, we're, we we're, we just can't right now. So I managed to, to use that pitch with you guys. And it was so great to be able to use actual words I'd already written and then take it into a slightly different direction with this you know compilation. There's no such thing as a wasted word, writers. Ever. It's true. Not a it's word. True. Not I a, think not a word. I think all of us stumbled across 
something in our previous research and we're like, oh, I would love to work on that or something. And we just weren't able to put it into other books. And then here comes this project like, oh, that idea I got, I can now use it for this because that's what happened with with mine. I stumbled across the Tin Noses shop doing research yeah. for another World War One book. And I thought that would be fascinating. Talk Beauty about Among it. Ruins, which everybody has to read. It was probably so that one or, or something. And I was like, that would be cool. You know, just stick it in the good idea file. And then I was able to use it here, which was really nice. So it's like, you're able to use these little ideas that maybe wouldn't have gone into a full length novel, but yet we get to work on them in a smaller novel and still talk about it. Yeah. Those those concepts that are too not quite big enough for a novel, but too big to, to shoehorn into a big novel. Yeah, because you have to have a bigger arc. And I think that part of the reason why Janelle's story is so captivating, and if you look at the reviews of the book, so many of them said, "I love Janelle's," because mm -hmm. that that bit about the everybody the loves mask, Janelle. Everybody loves Janelle forever. But, um, you know, the the God. fact you know, that the whole mask <laughs> painting. You know, I've seen it touched upon. There's a movie, a recent movie I watched on a plane trip for a research um, trip to Paris called Amsterdam about the the um, artist who painted masks. Um, and it's just absolutely fascinating. But I haven't seen, you know, novels about it or novellas. Is, is and that what I, you Amsterdam's know, I, is about? I had no idea. Uh, it, no, it, it it's was, like a murder it, mystery. Oh. It is a murder, it's a murder mystery, but that is like it's one element of it. Yeah. It, it, it. It shows up. Um, it's kind and, of quirky. It's it shows yeah, up it the is Boardwalk a, Empire weird. too. I remember the Boardwalk Empire episode about the mass. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway, sorry. I, I, I saw so many weird movies, guys. I saw so many weird movies on ice when they're going over to Paris. We could talk about that. But we're... <laughs> yeah. So next one time, we'll talk about the movie, The Menu. Weird, weird, weird. But anyway. Oh, I um, saw that. That's very weird. Yeah. I heard, very I... weird, but so good. So, so good. good. You have I don't a think we can we'll recommend that to like the general public. I think you have to be a certain kind of. You mood have for to that. know. You have yeah. You okay. have to be in the mood for something very dark, very strange, but also a brilliant critique of elite foodie culture that I loved because so much of my work spans Especially on, and I'm really getting more Paris. towards the food. Yeah, a bakery in Paris, which is very foodie, and in my upcoming book. The Memory of Lavender and Sage, extremely foodie. The one after that for my next contemporary, also extremely foodie. And getting into some of the echelons of elite foodie culture. So fascinating. So fascinating. Because that's so not me. I have, you know, such it's such kind of a blue collar upbringing comparatively. You and it's just it's, all the time. All the I time. do. I do. But it's something that I love. Yeah. But it's not something that, you know, the elite foodie culture is something so foreign to me. Like I know a decent wine from a crap wine, and but like some of this stuff, oh my gosh. Well, I don't even know that. I just drink because I like the label. Hey, that is not a bad way to go. I, it has served me well. That. It has served that is me well. So true. Look at this worry. cute vintage label. And then you win Janelle over. Um <laughs> she's very aesthetic, and you see that a lot in her <laughs> books as well. Um it's true. You have such a visual detailed eye for things. I'm an uh, imagery person. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And that's something that Janelle and I mean, even Jill, even more so than me, but I end up like picture files before I even start writing. Like I have, I have pictures of the house where people live and their clothes and this, that, and the other thing. So, and trinkets, they have to have, you know, some sort of a trinket of some kind. And, you know, that visual piece helps me to bring it to life. So do you, have, is that something you do like storyboard, Janelle and Rachel or no? I have Pinterest boards. I have Pinterest boards too. The one thing that mm -hmm. I have trouble with and that these ladies do well is with few exceptions, I have trouble finding a real life person who looks like. So if somebody asked me who would play your character in a film, I see them so clearly in my imagination. It's often really hard. Um, yeah. so with, like with Alec and with Brigitte in this, um, I can't really picture people. I'm sure sometimes readers will send me ideas and I'll be like, oh yeah, that could work. Um, but I know that, <laughs> do you know what? Let's just talk about Buck Winter. Let's just talk about, I know that Sebastian Stan is yeah. why <laughs> yes. Janelle's new duology came to be. Yes, because who wouldn't want to write about him? I mean, Brilliance of Stars and To Free the Stars, which are both amazing and quite unique in historical fiction. 
Um, and again, I mean, I got to look at his that. picture all day. All day. That's so That's rough, awesome. Janelle. That's so <laughs> rough. What the things we do for our art. Well, I know. What did what did the lazy beagle think? <laughs> she was too busy snoring. She doesn't care. <laughs> it's Daisy, right? The beagle. Thing? Daisy. Oh. Daisy a bug. Yeah. Um, She's cute. And I don't have any pets, but I did write a cat into Castle Sigmund. Keepers. Yes, yeah, Sigmund Freud. Um, and it's partly because I have two readers, and they're always my early readers, Renee and Courtney. And whenever a book goes to galley proofs, I send them the document of the book, and they always just read my stuff early um, because they've just been so supportive from day one. And anytime I write a cat, They've been really into it. So I'm like, I am going to give them a little bit of a treat. I am going to write them a cat. And so Sigmund the cat is in Castle Keepers, my portion. And oh, on cat related news, um, <laughs> Amy has two cats, Gigi and Bijou. And I yeah, have a Zuri. Zuri. Yeah. Why did I think Bijou? Oh, Bijou is no. the name of the bakery. Bijou is the name of the bakery. So <laughs> Okay, I'm getting it mixed up, but I have a book coming out in December called Operation Scarlet, and Gigi is the name of the nightclub that my heroine sings at in honor of the cat, and Bijou is the name of a restaurant in the Montmartre area where I'm writing about. Yeah, um, which is the name of my bakery, honor. yeah. Yeah, because we were we when we were writing this, we were always talking about the 18 billion other projects we were working on mm -hmm. at the same time. Yeah, it, let's just Constantly. say, guys, if you like if you like the Castle Keepers, we've got other stuff to keep you entertained between the three <laughs> of us. We've got your TBR covered. We've got an entire library. Yes, we do. Exactly. Oh, oh yeah. we've been working. Yeah, we've been working a lot. And it's, it's such a great thing. Like, you know, a line from Downton Abbey I loved. The only thing worse than too much work is not enough or not enough work is too much or whatever, however you said it. But yeah, we've been working on a lot of projects. We've been very fortunate to have um, so many things, so many irons in the fire. But I wrote well, a cat too, to a PG Gigi cat, Aww. who's my editor cat. He, I usually write with him on the couch or my chair, like right here. And he looks like he's reading the screen. Gigi's and I have a, a black beautiful cat. beautiful black cat. And you yes, should follow he's Amy on Instagram and see Gigi. Yes. He's a well, great I love expensive that we cat put this week. We put all of these like personal behind the scene um, trivia in our in our books, you know, like the private conversations that we have. Sometimes they'll pop up into the books or references or I think mm -hmm. I had one about um, ants like I had to have this house come tumbling down and the fire wasn't going to work. And Amy was like, oh, we'll make sure it's oh, it's termites, termites, or termites. Something. And so that's what made it into the book. And then I think I made a note about it towards Amy, you know, and then you have your naming uh, nightclubs and all this other stuff. So if you're paying attention or if you know us, then you will spot all these little bits of um, trivia in our books and you can tell what we were talking about or watching at the time, which I think is a lot of fun. And it was yeah. during the pandemic that we really, a lot of lockdowns that we were really, yes. really working on this. So it was kind of our only community piece. Um, <laughs> it was such a lifesaver. It was such a mental, you know, yeah, I, you know, I was the person I was dating at the time during the lockdown who eventually became my husband. Yeah, we talked a lot, but, you know, so many people were just drowning in work because they were trying to keep everything functioning from home and, and working under so many different constraints. But this was something we could do together. And it was, you know, it felt like, you know, a way of sort of socializing, but also working. And it was such a mental, I don't know, it was, it was, um, it was a mental relief in a lot of ways. It was, a, it was an escape. And, and to have that with two other people. Experience like in working, because we're all very different writers. Yes, um, very different processes. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and I'd never collaborated before. Mm -hmm. And guys, it was far harder than you might think. Yes. I, I really appreciate and love every reader or reviewer or bookstagrammer who has pointed out the continuity and how the books, uh, the separate Close. stories intertwine yeah. to create a cohesive narrative throughout all because you have no idea how many times we had to go back to the drawing board especially with the family 
family lineage um yes. and the, the timeline and oh, making sure that like people Lord. yeah we didn't have to kill off my characters when they were too young <laughs> like is that give them a happy wait. ever after but they're dead at 58 right. Sorry. Dead at 28 it's the worst yeah. romance ever um no it's it, it took a lot and the continuity of the describing the poison garden describing the portraits uh that carry on throughout it was it was really fascinating but also there were moments where it's like oh my gosh we just pulled out a piece of the jenga tower mm -hmm. and it all do you guys have jenga in america yes oh, oh yeah okay. oh yeah we um, have sometimes i'm like this is an obscure canadian thing no. anyway you pull out the jenga thing and everything falls down but we we did it we thanks did to it. some awesome editors too though who just yeah. oh thank goodness well and I, I i found a problem because i ended up moving my story 30 or 10 no it was just a 10 year shift but it, it but it changed a lot because it was much earlier in the whole dollar princess phenomenon and i referenced the that's the problem of referencing real people i referenced caroline astor <laughs> who was really at the beginning of her sphere of influence in 1870 but I referenced in the first draft when it was supposed to be 1882, I referenced her son, J.J. Astor. But if I take it back 10 years, he would have been six years old. So he would not have been <laughs> in the drawing room titling champagne with the other members of the 400. And so, um, yeah, I had to like just I thankfully I was so worried by the time I got the final version because I noticed that he was still J.J. Astor was still in the draft or the art, the advanced review copy. And so when I got the final ones in my hands, it said, oh, some Astro relation I didn't know. Yes, it got changed because <laughs> I wasn't sure. I, you know, it's just one of those things that keep you up and the things that wake you up at three in the morning. Oh, God, did that get changed? I'm going to get, you know, slayed by some armchair historian who's watched the Gilded Age show on HBO 18 times. I'm going to get <laughs> murdered. But no, thankfully it got changed. Um, and but alive. if anybody listening notices any little inconsistencies or anything I loved, it was because like at the 11th hour, we had to move it back 10 years. And it it is so hard. It's like pulling the string on a sweater um, when you make those changes. It's so many little things. So I mean, I've enough, noticed that anytime I've had to make a timeline change. Woo if you're lucky enough to get an advanced copy of any book on the back, it always says, this is not a final product. Please take that into account because mm -hmm. um, it's really hard to read <laughs> reviews that mm -hmm. slay something that was finished for the final copy. Those things are just to ensure that people, media professionals, bloggers are given a snapshot of the story in a manner that's probably close-ish to what the final product will be, but there's still a few edits that go in between. Quite a few. I mean, yeah. honestly, it's often before, because they have to get them out in order to, to be effective. Arcs come out about six months before the book is out. And oftentimes that hasn't even been through the final round of copy edits yet. So, I mean, and that's the last time where you can make a big change in a book. Um, so that's the, you know, it's pretty early in the process, really. Mm -hmm. You know, it's been so, through one round of edits, but not, often so not the last see, two or three. There's a yeah. lot of drama going on behind the scenes that you don't get to see. And thankfully it all came together. I still can't believe I'm that so proud sometimes. No, I'm so proud. Like, you know, and I, I have a bad habit that Rachel and Janelle do not indulge in. I occasionally read our reviews and I was stumbling across them today. And so much of it, so, and bless all of you who have read the book and left a review, um, because it, honestly, the reception has been so warm. Like my, my heart was touched. I didn't read all the reviews in detail because I do have a little bit of an ego to protect um and but i scan them you know i scan them for for trends and things like that and so um you know it was really heartwarming and i appreciate it so very much um and you know and i i try to keep uh, you know tabs on all the reviews just because you know if somebody's not marked a spoiler or something it's good to keep an eye out for that but um yeah I, it's just because this book compared to you know when you're the only one with your, you know, stirring the pot, so to speak. I always use cookie metaphors, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that it's it's easy to go back and you realize, oh, I did, I added sugar here. I got to add a dash of salt. But if somebody else is working on it, you have, you know, it's, it's hard to know who's done what. And um, keeping the overreaching arc um, and not re re having to reread 18 drafts of your co-author's work, it's hard. Mm -hmm. 
you know? Mm -hmm. I think we've, and we learned a lot from it. Um, so, so much. We, cause we're coming up at the 36 minute after Mark. So I think we can talk about Liberty Scarf. We're, we're do actually, do, we're doing this again, everybody. Yeah. It wasn't um, bad enough that we hate each other. No, we to do it works really well. Um, <laughs> and honestly, that's amazing because in my day job, I'm a literary agent and I have clients who have had horror stories about collaboration. We've and all know, heard the horror I stories. I know authors who have had horror stories where it just didn't work, but this seemed to work really well. And we were able to take the things that were a challenge in the creation of Castle Keepers, which I think made us all better writers. Like it was oh, so for sure. Hard. I learned so much from the experience, but to be like, okay, never again are we going to have these generational things where it's like, oh timelines nope. off family tree yeah. um and <laughs> yeah i drafted a family tree for this whole thing she did she created it i still have it it's beautiful um <laughs> and it feels real it actually feels now that this family actually existed because of the all the time family yeah. we spent um but we've yeah i think that we've had some fun zooms where we've been able to take this uh and janelle why don't you tell us what the liberty scarf is about so you designed the scarf. <laughs> I sort of did. So <laughs> we we started talking about um, how we'd like to do maybe a Christmas type story yeah. because we I think yeah. we needed something a little more um, lighthearted after writing all of our war stories. Um, and so we thought, oh, a Christmas story would be kind of interesting. And let's do it during uh, the Great War because that's a time period that we're all pretty comfortable with. Yeah. Right. Well, let's do it about like the soldiers coming home for Christmas and, you know, this whole business and stuff. So yeah, then we started they... tossing, we started tossing around ideas. Well, what, what's going to be the continuous thread between our three different um, storylines? You know, well, maybe what if it's, what if it's an object this time that they have in common? No more bloodlines. No more of that. No more bloodlines. None. None. So, nope. so what if it's an object? So we started tossing around these ideas and I think maybe Rachel, you said a scarf. We'd have to go back through our chats. Yeah, I don't yeah, remember, to... but the scarf works so well. It, it did. And, and then I thought, yeah. what about Liberty? Liberty scarf, because they Liberty are, of London, yeah. they're famous for their uh, printed scarves. And right, let's do that. Okay, well now we have to come up with a design. And so I, with the help of my more artistic husband came up with um, a design for a scarf and it looks kind so of, good it's well, so good well y'all are it so it, it looks indigenous <laughs> to the time period it does so i wanted to take um very british tradition looking type images and combine it with something that they might have been experiencing during the war along with something uh looking towards the future so it has like an old british but yet art deco look to it along with the peacock feathers because that's what um liberty is famous for is their hera design so we threw it all into this one scarf and that's become the scarf and then amy was so generous and she bought each one of us a liberty scarf and yeah, so we have we like have a little those. team when we yeah. do our warbix event for liberty scarf we're all going to wear our little scarves we are um, we yeah i so wore mine in thing. paris when on my research trip because i'm not gonna i mean who why am i i don't look like an idiot walking around estes park in my jeans with my beautiful liberty scarf you but, should, you should do it why not who cares where yeah. you live that's true but you know i'm often in hiking clothes it doesn't kind of you know, yoga <laughs> pants with the liberty scarf she's so adventurous but. um and once we had the scarf it was just again really interested in focusing on three different heroines mm -hmm. who are affected by war romance we're employing more letters and epistolary um tenets to this project which yes. i always like um it's different than writing on our own, we write novels that are like a hundred thousand words. Mm -hmm. It's very different to have to execute action and emotion in 35,000 words, which is, you know, what we do when we're writing these books where we have to kind of condense uh, without, yeah. without the story feeling like a tiny story. It still has to have that heft and weight. 
Exactly. I kind of, you know, because I've written quite a few multi timelines. So it really is about the same length as like if I have three timelines or three POVs, it works the same way. And I'm excited because we are going to interweave chapters this time. So it is going to read more like a novel. Um, And so it's going to be in some ways trickier and easier to edit, I think. Um, But it's going to be really exciting. And I love the idea. Because the promise was, and I, I you know, this was the, the genesis, I, I told the girls, there was a push to get all the soldiers home by Christmas mm-hmm. um, at the end of the Great War. And I said, that could be our genesis idea that Ra- um, Janelle brings in, or Janelle and Rachel start talking about the scarf. And then, because of my point of view had been, you know, the American soldiers, that was a push to get them all back to the U.S., that was a tall order back in 1918 to get the Americans back and the Canadians back. By nineteen eight, by Christmas of nineteen eighteen, when the armistice was in November, and that's that's a tremendous amount of work to get those uh, the troops back home. But then, of course, Janelle and Rachel, being you know us having kind of disparate cultural backgrounds, etc., um, they said, "Well, I want to do you know a different country." And so I have the Canadian immigrant to the U.S. as my te- my character is going to be exciting, and she's going to be a hello girl. Um, so drawing on my story um, from girls on the line and then rachel and janelle are bringing characters from england and from um belgium 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 yeah. i could not that word was right on the tip of my i know <laughs> no there's so many european i've i i really romanticize brussels i think it's one of the most underrated cities romantically yeah. um in fiction and so we've we've had a lot of fun playing with it and fallen down a lot of really interesting research rabbit holes um and I don't know about these girls, but sometimes when you start something, it sparks ideas for other books. Mm-hmm. You're never just yeah. working on one book. Your mind is exactly. collecting, like, like Velcro. Yeah, yeah. What else? German, you do German Brides was born from research from yeah. across the Winding River. It's just how it happens. Hi, guys. Hi, Hi Julie. Julie. And you've got, and I love it because it's just like, yeah, I can't even imagine because it's kind of like, What's the whole adage? Squirrel, you want to like go off and like? <laughs> oh, yeah. It is constant. I mean, I'm in line edits for Operation Scarlet right now, and just the other day, I line edits means it's one of the final editorial rounds before it goes into production. Just the other day, I stumbled upon something where I'm like, this could be an entirely different chapter. I do. You have to cut yourself off. You right. have to be like, stop. You right. want to throw everything in all the time. Yeah. yeah. And just save it for like, oh, here's a bonus chapter that you can get if you send it for my <laughs> newsletter. Yeah. I'll send you this. So, <laughs> okay, let's talk about the scarf for a minute because it was, you know, that it was um, inspired by all the British things. So what were you ladies doing during the coronation on Saturday? <laughs> Sleeping. Did you all, did you I, all wake up and set your I own did watch? not. Um, I did not watch it. However, at church on Sunday, they did that handle piece, uh, Zadok the Priest, which has mm. been done at Coronation. I'm a huge classical music buff. Um, if anyone's read my books and um, for the past like 300 years of Coronations, they always do that amazing piece. And so I knew that it was going to be at the Coronation and I didn't watch the Coronation, but it was really amazing that my exceptional church choir and their organist did it on Sunday. So Ooh. it's like the Coronation followed me. Also, we get new money um, yes, in Canada, of course, yeah. and our flag has changed a little bit. So there's that, but it's it's really interesting how people can be immersed in history that we read about and research about a lot because coronations have been going on since the dawn of time um i'm friends with jennifer robson who wrote coronation year another toronto author uh and so obviously following her socials you get the behind the scenes of what everything means means. and right 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 yeah know the meaning of it that was the (laughs) thing that i because i did not because i'm obsessed with the you know I watched Diana and Charles get married back in 1981. I mean, I just did the whole thing. But um, so I wasn't, I told my husband, I said, I'm not setting an alarm, but if I wake up in the middle of the night, I'll go out and watch. What it's time all. was it there then? It was three, I, I it started at two in the morning here, but Gosh. I did wake up at about 3.30 and I did go down and I started watching it. And so it was just, to me, it was, I loved just the, just the history of it all and the, and the, and the traditions of it all. It felt a little, odd in color and in you know yeah. 2023 with some of the things yeah, like 
it feels anachronistic. It's something that has been, you know, it feels like, oh, I've been transported back 300 years in time. Right. But yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, it's hard. You know, I, I, I'm uh, definitely um, as American as they come when it comes to position on the monarchy. But, um, you know, it is, I can understand the fascination because we don't have an equivalent it's here. It's such in a US. spectacle. Really Jan uh, Janelle, did you watch it? I did. I um I saw like the the second half of it. I came in right right as they were doing like the crowns and stuff. I was like, oh good, I didn't miss it. Yeah. But I mainly watch it because I love Princess Kate. I'm like, what is she wearing? Right. So that was my main. She, but she, she was all covered up until like, she was covered up though until we saw her at the at the pictures in the in the crown room. Yeah. But she still looked amazing, and I was amazing. very disappointed that she didn't wear a tiara but oh yeah i mean the, the flower thing was still really pretty well i think oh, it was and, alexander mcqueen did the uh, design yes. of it and kind of matched her look at him i, I know a little too much about this it looked and like matched tiara, her though. but with um and did like a separate version for her daughter for charlotte yes so they yeah, kind of charlotte coordinated and louis, charlotte and louis look like princess leia and luke skywalker and mm -hmm. i was there for it i love that so yeah, much they were so They're cute really so anyways just had to get the new and and i i <laughs> This shows my ignorance, though, too, a little bit, Janelle, because I did not realize this. I did not realize that Canada was a commonwealth until they talked about changing the money. I thought Canada was Australia just a standalone. Australia, too. No, yeah. um, the king is our head of state. Yeah. Uh, and there were huge coronation activities. Um, you know, we were technically in mourning for a month after the queen passed away right. in the fall. All the flags half mast. Every A lot of people were black. It was a subdued thing. Um, there are several countries like Australia, like us, that like, are yeah. still still Commonwealth. Uh, I we're did not still a call. We are technically a colony. Um, I don't yeah. find that it it really influences my day to day life, but right. Um, it does mean when I go over to England for research trips, the like obviously I, they're just so welcoming anyway. But it 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 is something that is appreciated. It's, right, they they love Canadians and. Yay. Oh. <laughs> all right. Well, that's good. Okay. So here's my next question for you all. And um, Janelle, we'll start with you. So did you do, because now that we can travel, I know that Rachel, you don't want to travel. Did you all, did you do any traveling for this book for research or did you just reach reach out into things that you guys could just kind of. No, uh, yeah, this was our lockdown book. Yeah. yeah oh, we, okay. we wrote this, um, I think right as we were coming out or um, in the middle of, or something. And I started way ahead. I, I'm that person, but um, no, Jeez. I didn't travel for it at all. So Google images, Google maps, that was my friend. I mean, that's how I do most of my research is through that. Cause you can't go to every single place that you no. are. And Janelle wants her budget to always be Scotland and it has to be Scotland. And if she's going to travel, it must yes, be Scotland. Because you know what? We did pitch this to be located in Scotland. It was initially in Scotland. And they oh. said, no, yeah. no, we have so to. So I said, something. we're going to go as far north in England as they'll let us go. Oh, so there. Right. go. Right. Of I love it. Okay. So you talked about, and Amy, I'll throw this one to you. So you all talked about how your timeline got all. So that wasn't something that you did originally as put a, a family tree or a timeline together. So what what point did you do that, Amy? Did you do the, the family tree? Um, well, the family tree, we I, I put that together kind of late in, in the game to make sure that everything meshed up as far as dates. And I used like, oh, was it familytreegenerator.com or something like that? <laughs> and I, I use it for a lot of my book. I've used it a few times, like um, for a bakery in Paris to figure out like to what generation, because it was going to be three generations of women and it just didn't work. And so it's two is like 1870 and 1946. And, you know, just juggling out like how many generations apart they were and figuring out everybody's birth dates and death dates. And so much of it does not end up in the book. But for me, I felt like I needed to know that. So yeah, I did it. You got to have that background. Game when we wanted to make sure that all the dates worked after I shifted it. And it was a 12 year shift, but it really kind of unraveled a lot. If we hadn't been really paying attention and we didn't have amazing editors, it could have been a real problem. Yeah. But thank you. It worked out. So, to a technical question, which is this, and you talked about it a little bit, um, but Rachel, to you, um, 
how do you all communicate? Do you do a Discord? Do you do Zoom? What do you do as far as like, how do you communicate? We've done some, we do some Zooms. We are constantly in a Facebook messenger chat. Okay. Um, that powerhouse. like constantly called the powerhouse. We also have a private Facebook group. That's the three of us okay. um, where that is something that we use for like sharing photos. Um, but it's honestly that Facebook messenger group, the powerhouse uh, <laughs> was is just constant, constant communication, sometimes yeah, about even, this, but often about other things. Like right. my cat is Amy's sick. Cat. Um, because I use, because I, I cat, do it. Yeah. Yeah, I do a thing that's a little different than this that they they introduced me to this thing called Discord. Okay, which I don't know I that one. Absolutely love. It's kind of like a Slack. It's this thing you can create channels and you can have like you can pop on and talk to each other and send each other. Wow. And you can send like um files to each other through it. It's fantastic. So I wasn't sure if you guys used something like that. I had never heard of it before. So I was like, we all have, we, Amy was the first on board with Scrivener, um, which is a writing tool. And right. then I started using it a few months ago and fell in love and Janelle has started using it. And Oh, welcome gosh. to the yeah. dark side. Yeah. Oh. Discord, Discord's more of a communication thing. Yeah. It's how to communicate with each other. Yeah. Because I can't even imagine how hard this is, like Google Drives and Docs and who's, oh, who's typing. Yeah, we have to do that too. Yeah, we have to do that too for um, like we're working on that for the Liberty Star. We're working on an outline together. And yeah. Oh, I think it would make my head explode. Yeah. It, and Christina McMorris and Sue Meissner and Ariel Lawen, that's how they did their When We Had Wings. Um, yeah. Which yeah, they wrote in Google, Google Docs. They wrote they? in a shared Google Doc, which dear like, Lord, not there that yet. freaks me. That freaks me that out. That freaks as a me out because if you <laughs> change something, oh my, and you have to show people your very vulnerable early drafts of work, and I find yeah. that that was to me because I have such a weird cinematic brain and such fragmented manuscripts that always come together at a weird point um that was to me the most challenging part of this is that yeah. you're working with two I mean I met Janelle and Amy both individually because I gushed over their books I read their books and fell in love and bombarded them with my fangirling um and that's how we met and uh so to have two writers that I respect read right. my absolute crap early on you know it, it is you have to you have to you have to open yourself up vulnerability yeah yeah yep all right so well, amy uh, we know yeah. we know you've got a book coming in august it's right behind you call the baker a baker in a baker in paris baker in paris and just a little fyi for those of you lucky listening we just scheduled a date in august for a virtual event for that so come back and let's hear us talk about that one janelle what are you working on Anything that's coming my, separately? Yes, my next book is called To Free the Stars, and it's the second part of the Jack and Ivy duology, and it actually releases a week before Amy's does, so. Okay, well, maybe we'll see Janelle here, too. Who knows? Who knows what, what things will happen on Warwick's virtual? <laughs> Rachel, I think you've got something, too, coming up. I out. have a book coming out in December called Operation Scarlet. It's World War II Paris. It's my homage to the story of the Scarlet Pimpernel, but in World War II. Oh. Um, and I'm currently writing a few different things. Um, one of them is kind of cool. It's a biography of Sir Christopher Wren for a London publisher. Um, and that opportunity came out of a book I wrote called The London Restoration, came out in 2020. And it's all about the rebuilding of the London churches after World War II. And Ooh. it caught the eye of an editor who was like, wow, you really are a church architecture nerd. Would you like <laughs> to write us an accessible biography of Sir Christopher Wren? And I'm like, research trips. Yes. So yes, sign me up. Yes. Yeah. But you also did a research trip. And I'm curious, is, the Vienna I was in research, Vienna. is that going to be something? It's that... coming out in 2024. Um, But I am not allowed to talk about it yet. My editors okay. and HarperCollins have said, keep this one under wraps Ooh. or uh, Amy and Janelle won't know what it is, but it's one of those books that has a. I know. I'm just, uh, Amy, you and I. That are they like, just kind of want to keep under the radar for now. But I love it. Yeah. Well, ladies, uh, as I will come. Re yeah, I'll, come say, I'll come interview Rachel for Yay! Operation Scarlet. Yay! Because we'll Paris. Yeah. 
Yeah, <laughs> it'll be Janelle, great. Hey, Janelle, you're invited too if you want to just come and like hang with. Oh, us. good. Yeah. I'll just crash the party. <laughs> just come and crash the party. You <laughs> always show up everywhere I am, Janelle. Just pop it's, up. Just okay. pop up. Just pop up, <laughs> ladies. It was so fun again having all of you. Thank I, you, Julie. So I just think it's so much fun when uh, we get to bring authors together like this. So appreciate your time. And everybody, Castle Keepers is in the chat. It'll be on the YouTube to do as well. There it is. And go get a copy now. Mother's Day. Wait, Mother's America, Day. Mother's, Mother's, Day. Mother's Day. Yep, it's coming next Same day. Time we do. Yep, yep, yep. Yes. Do it. All right, everybody. Have a good night. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.